So this morning, I'm really delighted to welcome Dylan Mulvin, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Media and Communications, and he'll be talking about his new book, Proxies, The Cultural Work of Standing In, which is actually available open access, so you can download it for free as a PDF after this talk, I'll put the link in the chat, um, or you can purchase it as a paperback if you prefer to have the proper book from later this week. So after the talk, we will have time for questions. Please write any that you have in the chat at the end and we'll come to those. Um, but for now, I will hand over to Dylan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Um, and thank you everyone for, for showing up this morning. Um, thank you so much to Louise for organizing these events. It's wonderful to see some familiar faces, some familiar icons in the participant list. Um, as Louise mentioned, the book is out as of yesterday, um, though we're waiting for some uh, background maintenance to the MIT website to make it uh, uh, the open access version available there. If you go to my website, uh, dillamulvin.com, um, you can download the PDF of the full book today, or just start with the introduction if you're not sure. I'm going to share my screen and um, begin. I think a year and a half into this, I'd have the order down pat. There's the cover. In the southwest of Arizona, near Yuma, you can find a small town called Yodaville. With a town center and eight radiating boulevards, it stands in stark contrast against the surrounding desert. Yodaville is empty. In fact, it's never been lived in because Yodaville is a test city, or to put it in the terms of the US military who built it, Yodaville is an urban target complex made of shipping containers. Chances are you've never heard of Yodaville, which was built in response to American military deaths in the Battle of Mogadishu, the events that you might recall if you've seen the film Black Hawk Down or read the book. Believing that their training was overly reliant on mock cities that looked too European, the US military built Yodaville in the 1990s. It was designed in the loaded terminology of one Rand Corporation report about Yodaville to reflect, quote, the chaotic environments found in densely populated areas of the developing world. Yodaville is a kind of proxy city for the world out there right, in contrast to the world in here, the space of testing and simulation. When the American military saw the edges of its empire strained by war in unfamiliar territory, they decided they needed a better proxy for the kind of places they would be going to war in the future. Sure enough, when they went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, one colonel put it bluntly. If a pilot can drop a bomb and hit a target in Yuma, he can drop a bomb and hit a target in Iraq. They got heat, we got heat. It is the ideal place to train. So in my new book, Proxies, The Cultural Work of Standing In, I begin with a broad and somewhat naive question, to whom or to what do we delegate the power to represent the world? That is, what are our proxies? To answer that question, I turn to the tools, the people, and the places like Yuma, Arizona, or Yod Yodaville that become fixed points, right? Standard objects uh, in the standardization of knowledge. Proxies, I argue, act as models of the world out there, which are necessary components of making an institution run and of keeping it afloat. Right? It's how people make knowledge and how they bind communities together. So if proxies are those people and those places and those things that we choose to stand in for the world, they play all sorts of different roles in holding those communities together and making societies run. So we have proxy voters, right, who stand in for us when we can't be present to vote. We have proxy servers that buffer our connection to the internet um, for security or other purposes. And we have proxy wars, right, that serve as satellite battlefields. The person, the place, or the thing itself is a trusted delegate, standing in for something else, allowing us to displace the need for the real thing in order to accomplish some social, 
some technical or some political goal. In this way, proxies are a means to an end, right? And we can think about the simulation warfare in Yodaville as another kind of proxy war. But I'm generally is interested in the world of less obvious proxies, those things that kind of suffuse our lives and go without notice. So we have something like the color bars that you might use to calibrate your television or your computer monitor, which itself is an intermediary, a proxy for the normal range of visible light, right? That should appear uh, normal for um, an idea of human vision that's calibrated to that light. And we can use it to adjust our, uh, our expectations of how our images look. We have something like the market basket of goods, which doesn't look anything like this, but it's hard to represent, right? Which calculates the average cost of living um, that stands in for an average consumer's uh, purchasing habits. And we use that to calculate inflation, something that um, we're hearing a lot about right now. We have mock juries, right? We might use to predict the success of lawsuits or criminal trials to simulate social relations and legal disputes. We have crash test models that we use to stand in for our bodies at moments when they are at their most vulnerable. Unlike the way that Yodaville became Iraq and Afghanistan, these aren't proxies for a specific place or a specific person, right? It's not like a proxy voter. These are proxies for ideas of the average, the ideal, or, or the normal. They are necessary forms of make-believe that we use in the production of knowledge and the standardization of the world. And here, I think, is where things get tricky, right? We know that those concepts, I can throw them out, but we know that those concepts, the normal, the average, and the ideal, are often containers for other beliefs and ways of putting people and things into hierarchies. So while the proxies I've just listed might escape notice on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, they mold what is visible, they mold how we can afford to make do, or our prospects for legal fairness, or how we might survive an accident. But they are cultural artifacts. They're steeped in the biases and favoritisms of people and the limited ways we might envision our world. Hence, color television has been notoriously bad at reproducing non-white skin. That market basket of goods is also notorious for failing to capture quality of life as opposed to affordability. Mock juries reinforce legal inequities and the bodily template of crash test models has been tied to higher mortality for people who don't conform to its notions of the average, including most women. Hence, a key aspect of thinking about proxies for me is the way they are shaped by and in turn shape the politics of everyday life and culture. So through the history of um, a few specific proxies that take this form, uh, the book shows how those who must, by professional obligation, use proxies, leverage a representation of our current world to foresee and craft a world to come. If we think of proxies as those things that we use as stand-ins, I think we can think of proxification, really ugly word, um, as a kind of cultural practice in which we consistently use some things to stand in for the world. And I just wanna highlight that word consistently because while it's true that we are surrounded by proxies that are more or less ready at hand, right? Yodaville is less ready at hand. None of us could go there. It's a closed military site. The egg perfect egg timer, which I use to stand in for eggs is um, literally ready at hand. Uh, but some proxies matter more than others, right? I will uh, stipulate, I think Yodaville matters more than the egg perfect egg timer. Some proxies last longer, some become more entrenched and some become more crucial um, for their home institutions. So beyond Yodaville, the book itself is structured around three additional case studies of proxies that have lasted or did last an inordinate amount of time, each of which I think illustrates um, the way proxies absorb their cultural surroundings. 
So chapter two, for instance, tells the story of the international prototype kilogram, which until recently, two years ago, uh, was the last remaining physical artifact that was used as a standard in the metric system, right? So for uh, 150 years, a piece of platinum iridium that looked just like this one here um, stood in for the idea of mass. But here I approach the lifespan of that basic measurement proxy by examining the protocols for keeping kilograms clean. Um, and this is the actual protocol for cleaning kilograms with a chamois leather cloth. One of the central arguments of proxies is that we can understand the role that stand-ins play in society through the work people have to perform to keep them viable. If proxies are analogies for the world out there, then we have to keep track of all the labor it takes to keep that analogy alive, right? to keep that relationship um, viable. When I was researching the history of the metric system then, I was amazed um, to find, because there, there's this, there are these reports of how they consecrated the kilogram, buried it in its tomb, in, in a, what they describe as a kind of tomb with the documentation of what made it the kilogram. They locked it behind three keys. They distributed those keys to three different important people. This is in Sevres on uh, the suburbs of Paris, right? So it's kind of beautiful, really um, uh, a specific ritual to consecrate the kilogram as the kilogram, capital T, capital K. But then within a couple of decades, you get these much more understated guidelines for how to actually clean the kilogram. Since it's made of platinum iridium, it's actually porous, right? So it, it absorbs any contamination that's in the atmosphere. And over time, the mass of the kilogram changes, which is a huge problem uh, if you're counting on it as the um, reference standard for mass. So um, the guidelines uh, specify, you know, how to wash the kilogram with a ether solution, how to rub it with a chamois leather cloth to give it, quote, a rather handsome, but not specular appearance. So I think that if we can talk about hygiene for kilograms, the basis of virtually all mass measurements in the world, in terms of handsome but not specular appearances, I think that there must be a kind of inescapable bodily and aesthetic dimension to how we uh, handle information and data. Something that we think about quite a bit as we think about digital labor and the background um, work that goes into making, say, uh, uh, social media platforms um, run. Um, but the history of the kilogram shows us that the manual and embodied labor it takes to maintain an information system long predates the digital and extends to the most basic units of measurement science. The center, central two chapters, chapters three and four of the book, tell the history of digital image processing by following this image here. This is one of the most widely used test images in existence called the Lena or Lena image. It was integral to the development of digital imaging and AI for images from the 1970s onwards. It got used so repeatedly, it became a central reference point um, in what we would call digital image processing and computer vision. The image that you see here is actually a cropped 512 by 512 pixel picture of a woman in a hat, which engineers at the University of Southern California, USC, cropped from the November 1972 issue of Playboy. So I document the environment in which the Lena image could seem like a possible solution to a range of test image problems, the need for a human face, uh, the need for complex images, the need for new images, and the apparent problem of an overabundance of so-called boring images, right? Engineers complained about um, images of tanks and territory. Here, I look at how all of these needs became cover for importing mainstream softcore pornography into the earliest days of networked image transmission. The Lena image, though, is just one node in a longer history of using the images of white women and white people to calibrate image technologies. So here we have in this, um, we have a Shirley card in the top left corner that's used in film calibration. 
we have these four pictures. These were used to, to standardize color television. The person on the beach is Jennifer in Paradise, the so-called first image of Photoshop. Throughout the 20th, 20th century history of image technology, we see repeatedly how often sexualized images of women have been used to train, calibrate, uh, and maintain image standards that were tuned to a kind of feminized whiteness. And so I turn to the late 20th century, looking in particular at the early 1990s and a time when the graphical World Wide Web was on the horizon. This is chapter four. And here I look to moments of resistance to the alienating and often abusive environments of computer science and image engineering. Um, here, conflicts in these environments were often directly tied to the visual culture of test images and complaints about the prevalence of porn and the sexualization of the work that people were doing. Together, the two chapters use image proxies to argue that the methods of seeing like an engineer that produced the Lena image in the first place are a product of institutionalized and professional vision inescapably tied to the practices of decoding and instrumentalizing women's bodies as proxies. The final case is a history of the standardized patient program, which began in the 1960s and transformed over 40 years into a necessary part of medical education. It tells a story in which the surrogate logic of proxies was extended to include human beings. So in the standardized patient program, actors embody the symptoms of illness and disability and trainee physicians both have to diagnose them and practice their bedside manner. So whereas we have you know, a few chapters in the book that examine um, how proxies manifest in things like metal um, and paper and pixels, the standardized patient chapter um, shows how a proxy can be maintained in and through a body, right? The bodies of workers, of cultural performers. And standardized patients, I think, reveal the limit for that surrogate logic of proxies. And they kind of chafe at the ability to create, create predictable and reproducible testing scenarios. But I would say as much as the human bodies of these actors show how proxies can be messy, I would say all proxies are messy, right? That's the outcome of analogy. It's never a yes or no proposition, but something that has to be maintained, something that is entirely perspectively um, based. Uh, finally, I would just say the goal of proxies is to tell the history of institutions through their practices of choosing and maintaining stand-ins. I argue that this approach provides a kind of entry point and a map for understanding how an institution views or wants to envision the world. I would also say we, we can't do without proxies, right? This isn't a screed against proxification, but I do think that close attention to who and to what we delegate as our chosen stand-ins can reveal the material and labor politics of proxification. I hope that in addition to the specific histories that are included here in the book, readers will come away with an interest in thinking about the world of standing in. Um, I will leave it there. I'm looking forward to some of your questions uh, and I'll just open it up now. Thank you, Dylan, that was really fascinating. Um, so yes, anybody with questions, please do pop them in the chat and we will put those to Dylan. I'll just reshare the link to your website so people who want to download a copy of the book and joined a bit late have the link. So a reminder that the book is available open access as a PDF to download via Dylan's website. Um, I'll start with a question if you don't mind, which yeah, is please. what was the strangest proxy that you came across in your <laughs> Um Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I collected, you know, this began with test images a long time ago and work I was doing on color television. And so I began by collecting a lot of images and sounds. Um, there's one in the book that is kind of makeshift by some um, photo enthusiasts that 
combines, you know, a picture of a car and a golf course and a large pile of meat and a naked bum um, and some jewelry. That one's quite conspicuous and weird. There are a couple that sometimes make their way into the news and they have to do with food. And so every few years you'll see somebody, I think, you know, in the doldrums of summer publishing that goes, oh, we should run a story about the test peanut butter. Um, and so there's this standard peanut butter that um, is used at the National uh, the um, National Institute for Standards and Technology in the United States. So if you're a peanut butter manufacturer, you have to buy this $800 um, jar of peanut butter to make sure that your peanut butter conforms to the standards of peanut butter. There's also the standard tagliatelle um, in Bologna. So if you um, think that your pasta uh, is fit to measure, you can compare it to the golden tagliatelle uh, in Bologna. Um, those are a couple of my favorites, partly because they seem um, on the surface a lot less um, uh, fraught <laughs> than the ones that I ended up writing about. And, and what was the sort of, what was the best proxy you found? Was there anything that actually was quite an equitable estimation of the real world? That oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, my I, probably my favorite um, uh, proxy is uh, uh, the Tracy Chapman song "Fast Car," which was used in the standardization of the MP3. Um, I think that the, I'm not sure it's equitable, but uh, it was at least chosen um, for aesthetic reasons that I I can agree with. Um, I think you know we're surrounded by. Um, things that stand in. Uh, some of them are um, easy to take for granted, like the, the egg timer. I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly um, concerned about um, the egg perfect egg timers uh, equity, though there's maybe a political history there that I'm missing. Um, but I, I would say probably fast car is my favorite. Um. One person says, have you looked into deep dream images as a proxy? Oh, wow. No, I want to hear more about that. Deep dream images um, that people uh, from from their own dreams. That was Olivia. Do you want to say Olivia. more, Olivia, on your question? Olivia, can you tell me more about deep dream images? As in AI generated. Oh, no. I would love to know more about that. And then another question, um, academia is an area that uses many proxies and standard measures such as citation measures. Is that an area that you've explored at all in your research? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the humanities and social sciences are full of um, common references, just the same way that the hard sciences are, right? And so there's an entire tradition of writing about working objects in hard science. So the fruit fly used in genetics research, or the mouse or rat used in behavioral sciences. Um, we can think about the undergraduate student who becomes a kind of proxy for um, psychological research, right? And lots of people have written about that fraught history. But um, humanists too, right? Liter literary scholars use the kind of logic of the stand-in. I mean, what that's what a that's what a block quotation is, right? If you wanna make an argument about literature, you choose a quotation at times that you think is emblematic of a style or a particular way of writing um, that the reader has to accept as a delegate for that author's um, style or form of expression. I think citation counts are a great example, right? As a proxy for the um, impact right? Impact itself has become a kind of container for our so all sorts of um, beliefs about uh, the effectiveness of research um, and its, its publication. Um, and I think as, you know, the, the academics on this um, call will attest, um, those beliefs are often also shielding something else about um, values uh, that have to do with how we investigate the world, right? And um, valuing social science or scientific research over that of humanities or or less, um, uh, uh, what am I looking for? What's the word? Um, less uh, um, ambiguous research, right? Um, 
Yeah, thank you. And and linked to that last question, Simi Dosikin um, is asking, is it possible to think of concepts then as proxies as well? Yeah, for sure, Simi, thank you. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the reasonable person standard, right? And um, it has a material analog uh, for London as well, right? So the reasonable person standard is a standard that used that gets used throughout often tort cases or civil cases, right? Would this be, is this defamatory? Would a reasonable person consider this statement defamatory? Would a reasonable person consider this kind of action to be harassment? Um, and the debate then becomes what is a reasonable person? Who is a reasonable person? What are their beliefs, right? And so the actual contest is not over the facts of the case, but over the contours of reasonableness and imagining who that reasonable person would be. As we know, reason is one of the um, more contested terms uh, in, in academia. But in the 19th century, uh, the reasonable person was often referred to as the man on the Clapham omnibus, right? And I live in Clapham. Uh, but in the 19th century, Clapham was, you know, a more distinct suburb of London. And so it was imagined that the man who would ride the omnibus back to Clapham was a kind of average suburbanite, neither too rural nor too urban, a kind of middle ground um, that you could expect to be reasonable. And so we can take a concept that's kind of mushy and debatable, like reasonableness, but also give it a material history. And that's the point of the proxy's book is to say, you know, even these ideas or these ideals um, often kind of get grounded in specific places and specific people um, like 19th century uh, Southwest London suburbs. If I can fit in one last very quick question, which is why you've chosen the word proxy, um, you know, do, can you tell us more about the etymology and why you've chosen it rather than, for instance, a standard or something else? Yeah, great question. Um, I settled on the word proxy. I, I used the term sort of reference materials for a long time, but um, I wanted something that could include um, the wider world of stand-ins from those concepts like the reasonable person to the objects like the images and pieces of metal that I talked about, but also those actors, those human actors who can um, perform as ill or disabled. Um, the etymology of proxy has a legal term um, and comes from um, a kind of uh, trusted delegate, right? Um, and so for me, it's a word that includes a wider world of standing in, um, but also kind of crucially that that dimension of trust, right? That there are things that we can allow ourselves to forget, right? Okay, well, I trust that the um, VPN will protect me or give me the access I need to the server I need. Um, I trust the proxy voter to execute what I've asked them to do. Um, and we almost never have cases of proxy voters going against um, what they've been asked to do. Um, and uh, um, I think that the term itself kind of reflects that broader world of standing in, um, trusting and delegation. Great, thank you. And we've reached half past, so we will leave it there. But thank you very much, John. That was fascinating. And as reflected in the chat, I think something people haven't thought about before, but you've really opened our eyes. 